If someone was to ask you, what is the perfect date? You would probably say something like a nice walk on the beach, going to a wonderful restaurant. And the perfect date that I will give you is January 1st, 1863, when the slaves were freed. <laughs> that is the perfect date. Uh, but then there's another date. <laughs> that is, it's, it's cool. It's not as perfect because, you know, white folk was on white folk time, June 19th. 1865. Mm -hmm. So, growing up, you knew something about Juneteenth. I did. For me, in California, I grew up in the blackest of black households, mm -hmm. reading all black literature. My parents named me Amisho Baraka, because they wanted us to have African names. Mm -hmm. I had never heard of Juneteenth. At least if they told us, it never stuck. Yeah. I didn't learn about Juneteenth until I actually got to Texas and I was around 22, I think, or 21. Okay. So um, tell me about growing up in Texas and celebrating mm -hmm. Juneteenth. So I was born in California. Okay. Yeah. All right. So, and while I was in California, uh, I didn't know anything about Juneteenth either. Yeah. But I moved to Texas, Oak Cliff. That's my hood. That's my hood. That's my hood. Um, I moved to Oak Cliff when I was nine years old. And that following year, I was baptized <laughs> in like <laughs> the culture of <laughs> Juneteenth. But and I remember being like in fifth grade, we had to take like Texas history. Mm -hmm. And so uh, yeah, I learned a lot about about Juneteenth at being a Texan. Um, we can get, we're going to get into the history in in just a second. But my my initial experience of Juneteenth was like jubilation, right? It was uh, parades, mm -hmm. it was parties, it was barbecues. There was a lot of rump shaking. It was, it was rumps, <laughs> rumps. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it was, a lot of liberation and rump shaking go together. <laughs> go together. <laughs> okay. All right, carnival. <laughs> carnival. Uh, <laughs> so it was definitely Body yes, yeah, yeah. Ahead, yes. No, no, no. It was like it was like parties, yeah. and so I remember like reading a, a little bit of history about Juneteenth. You know, this is uh, June nineteenth, uh, eighteen sixty-five. Two, uh, um, uh, two years later, after the uh, Emancipation uh, Proclamation was issued. Um, enslaved people in Texas uh, still didn't know yeah. the message hadn't hadn't reached them. Yeah, text um, messages was left unread. Yeah, unread. unread. They were just, right. <laughs> just like, <laughs> yeah, we didn't. There was no carriage, there was no horse set. There was nothing. The pigeons weren't flying. Back <laughs> pigeons <then>. were not <laughs> flying. Smoke signals, nothing at all. They didn't. They didn't get the memo. So these folks um, labored illegally yeah. for um, another uh, two years. Um, and so, and we're going to get into some of the implications of that, but I, I learned about that as, at a very young age, but there was a little bit of a of dissonance for me because I just was learning about this delayed and denied freedom. Um, but the, my judgments at the time uh, about the way that it was being celebrated, mm -hmm. um, where that I'm, I'm not understanding what shaking your tail has anything, you know, to do with this. Um, a little bit later, I still believe in modesty and discretion. But um, liberation is liberation, right? And people can like lean into that in whatever way, um, in whatever way that that feels Absolutely. that feels good to them. Um, and then I, you know, I can lean into it, and you can lean into it in whatever way that feels right uh, to you. So. Yeah, I, you know, I think not to make this, uh, you know, in Africa, <laughs> but <laughs> you know, uh, for the most part, I think it's known that people of the African diaspora are celebratory people. Oh, and yeah. how we celebrate usually is with music and dance. Yeah. And so I don't think it's any coincidence that even after funerals and repasses, we are yeah. dancing. We're yeah. doing an electric slide. Yeah. Because this is a way in which we celebrate um, life. It's a way we mourn. It's the way we deal with things. It's dance 
and music is a part of the milieu of what makes black people black people. Yeah. And yes, there are times when it can go a little overboard. Like if it turns into freak neck, that's a whole nother situation. You know what I'm well, saying? There's a time and a place for everything now. <laughs> <laughs> hey, but um, yeah, I, I'm of the belief that um, however people celebrate it is, is cool because you know, I don't think people's. Is there a way in which you celebrate July Fourth? You know what I mean. You know, I don't know. Well, the question is, do the people do we celebrate <laughs> July Fourth? <laughs> I have the belief that black people celebrate July Fourth in the same way they kind of celebrate like capitalism. Yeah. It's like you know, I'm gonna take advantage of it. Yeah, but I ain't gonna openly like celebrate. Yeah, it. like. They're going to go eat some food. Yeah. They're going to barbecues. <laughs> <laughs> We're not going to work. We're, We're not, not going to work. That. Don't try to make me go to work. See, like, back when Columbus Day, it was like, Columbus ain't yeah. fine out no Americas, but I ain't going to work. Today. You ain't about work, to eat. Though. I know that. I know that much. Okay. But, uh, so yeah, I think there is a sense in which um, uh, we can get to, I, I, the way that I love to think, like I, this blew my mind when I, discovered this thinking about watch night because every not every most black churches mm -hmm. celebrated watch night and watch night was usually like the december 31st going in the new year you have a search search service at like in the twilight of the night and you'll be up worshiping and listen to preaching and whatnot and then you guys are celebrate and i just i was just like i just i, I thought this was a way for real i thought this was a way just to keep people out of the streets Oh, I used to think that too. Like, either we're gonna be here or we're gonna be in the club. Oh, we're gonna be in the club, yeah. right? But then you come to realize, oh no, this is and it what black people didn't start this. The black church didn't start this. But like in the '60s, especially leading up to the liberation uh, with the Emancipation Proclamation, people would gather in churches waiting for the news of liberation and freedom, and so they were in the church celebrating and worshiping and singing about this liberation that was coming yeah and so when i realized that and learned that uh i was already i was in churches that weren't really doing watch night anymore so it was like man now that i truly understand this i really want to actually do watch nights yeah. because this is like our july 4th this yeah. is like our our um our yeah our our celebrate our parade and whatnot and i think similarly when i think about juneteenth because even when Granger came down to Galveston in the Houston area and informed these folks, a lot of these folks immediately went into the church and celebrated yeah. and had and spread the word that way. And it was just this huge almost parade that was popping off in these areas. And so in a lot of ways, I think we should get back to that. Yeah. But, you know, I have no problem with people having picnics and events at the clubs and no nah, you know, nah, me neither none neither. of that like that was and i'm not saying you said that you had yeah like, well i mean at the time though i was like a yeah, churchy yeah. judgy like yeah, kid yeah. like even at nine like mm -mm, holiness is right so <laughs> y'all free but y'all going to hell yeah. <laughs> i was definitely that like churchy there's judgy another slavery kid. coming for y'all you ain't gonna be able to escape it oh my god but now again like liberation is is for liberation you know what i mean and we have ideas about like um almost like a a bondage for lack of a better word that we opt into because mm -hmm. of following jesus yeah. right that's uh, a, that's the word you know what i mean even like, the use of words bondage i know it's like for some folks but i know i have no problem with you saying it you, you because it says we're now slaves yeah it's like yeah. the righteousness but go ahead restrictions restraints that yes. we like opt into yes because of following jesus absolutely um and so we're we're gonna get to that but you know again being a texan uh juneteenth was a, was a huge celebration and then i moved to uh atlanta in 20, 2006 and was like what are we doing for juneteenth yeah. and i went to an hbcu and everybody was like w w what's that <laughs> like no nobody knew like what it was yeah, yeah. and it wasn't until a few years ago it yeah. seems yeah. um as a result of the work of miss opal lee uh and we honor okay. her honor to opal. yes honor to opal um that now uh juneteenth as of uh june 17th 2021 um is now a national holiday mm. 
Um, and we've accomplished this, or she accomplished this, by starting back in 2016, I believe, at 89 years old. Walking. Walking. Walking from Fort Worth, Texas. Now, this woman is a treasure. Listen, a gem. A gem. Hidden treasure. Quick plug. If you guys want a wonderful documentary around this, please check out my man Rasul Berry's documentary called Juneteenth Faith and Freedom in which he interviews Opali as well. Yeah. You might hear some amazing music in that soundtrack. Oh, did, did right, you do the score? I mean, you know. Yeah. Come on. Come on, plug yourself. I mean, it's, it's just some dope. <laughs> yeah, that's what's up. Um, so you'll learn more about uh, Opal Lin uh, watching the documentary. Mm -hmm. um, at 89 years old, I believe it was, she began walking from Fort Worth, Texas to D.C. to bring awareness uh, to, to the uh, history of Juneteenth and to advocate for Juneteenth becoming uh, a national, national holiday. And in 2021, uh, President Biden... Um, made uh juneteenth uh, a national day of uh of observance yeah. and i think with that with uh miss opal's uh actions and with that proclamation there seems to be like just this new awareness resurgence like popularity people are having events they're hosting forums they're having mm -hmm. parades yeah. parties uh, single families are honoring it in ways that, you know, feel good to them. We're teaching our children the history, um, and it's really exciting. The other side of that, though, is I think that some of it, just like, you know, Black History Month has been a little bit co-opted, right? Oh, absolutely. By, by yeah. other people. Oh, yeah. I mean, corporations, individuals. I mean, our set, ugh, can Black people appropriate Black people stuff? You just, you could just, you can manipulate, you can, yeah. it's not co-opted, it would be more like. I think we can celebrate without, without education yeah, sometimes. Yeah, and just good intentions. Yeah. So, yeah, absolutely, you you know, corporations will do whatever they can in order to increase profits. And so if that's solidarity, um, there was actually a really interesting piece from, and I didn't watch or read it all, but from John Stewart about how the, like organizations co-opted the LGBT, like the Pride mm -hmm. Month. And that's been happening with Black History Month for forever. Uh-oh, 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 uh-oh. <laughs> Spir spiritual warfare. Oh Is that spiritual God. warfare again? <laughs> Gender attack. <laughs> Gender attack. I felt it coming. <clears throat> I was trying to catch it, but <clears throat> I didn't catch it. See, so the problem is you drinking that white man's water on Juneteenth. You know what I'm saying? If oh you was drinking God. water made from a black Man, you wouldn't be choking. See, this is what the man does to you. You know saying you drinking from the Pacific. You need to be drinking from the waters off the coast of Africa. You, you know what I'm crazy. saying? Because those waters actually cleanse your spirit and your soul. You know what I'm saying, brother? This is Malik L. Uh, show Baraka, and uh, we're gonna come back to you next week with another episode of Not the White Man's Water. <laughs> what is wrong with you? That's going to be great. <clears throat> okay, I'm so sorry. I finished. I don't even know what we <laughs> We were talking about um, corporations. Are you sure you okay? No. <laughs> oh, my God. Yeah. Oh, so, yeah. Yeah, it's... I think... Here's the... Here's the... This is a whole nother discussion. What is the responsibility of corporations and organizations? Because... When, they, when it's done right, you're like, hey amen, applaud. But so often it's not done well. And it does just feel like it's pandering in a way that's not, because you can find that yes, you'll market to us, you'll throw a brand up, but is anything changing within the executive spaces? Is anything changing in your hiring practices and your support in these particular communities outside of just saying, hey, representation on the brand. Yeah. Like, <clears throat> are we trying to do leadership development, scholarship funds, like in a legitimate, real way? And so my, my question is, is will we rather them just not do anything or to do it and fail? Or to do it and be messy, not to say fail, but to do it and there'll be messiness connected to it um, or to just say, you know what, just stay out of the social justice, the political. 
aspect and, and do things individually? No, I mean, I think it's important for businesses to contribute to the awareness of the of, of this history um, and of celebrating like marginalized folks. <clears throat> it's it's equally important or perhaps more important for them to really investigate like their practices as an organization. And like what I would love to see, and I'm not saying this doesn't exist, but <clears throat> what I would really love to see is corporations and businesses that are having these conversations around like equity, around like, be, you know, belonging, around, uh, you know, you know their, their business practices like all year long. Like you don't need Juneteenth as a trigger to do that right, if you're right, really right. about that life. Yeah. You don't need <clears throat> Pride Month or Women's History Month or Black History Month to trigger that conversation for you if you are really about it. So like, I, I think having folks of color uh, in the C-suite is also important. I think it's also important to like, <clears throat> look at your policies, look at your bylaws, <clears throat> look at your pay scales and truly analyze those things. What? <laughs> I'm trying to be real serious right now. I'm really trying to like, <laughs> look at your pay scale. <laughs> okay, I'll say it again. Look at your policies, look at your bylaws, look mm -hmm. at your pay scales, look at like the communities that you are and are investing yeah. in and like with criticality, like yeah. throughout the year, not just when it's like expedient for the yeah, one yeah. week we're talking about Juneteenth. Yeah. yeah. I'm, I'm kind of torn because I am of the belief that I don't need you to true, truly have your heart in the right place. Because if you do, if you're doing things, it benefits the people you're doing things for, even if your heart's not in the right place. Yeah. Because it's <clears throat> like it's it's almost to make it, you know, to turn to the religious uh, where Paul is talking to Philippians. He says whether it's by false pretense or whatever, like the gospel is being preached. He said there are some people out here who are doing it for their own benefit, but he says. There are, but there will be people whose lives are changed, even if those folks don't have the right mm -hmm. arts posture. And I remember being a part of a discussion around a reparations fund in Atlanta. And I remember one of the gentlemen who was, you know, one of the lead contributors, mostly white folks, were saying, well, it's, we don't want to just give money to a fund and, and create um, these resources without people's hearts changing. And I was like, well, excuse me, I hear you. <laughs> and I really want to see these folks and their hearts change. But I am more concerned with these resources. Yeah. <laughs> so in some ways, I look at these institutions and I'm like, yeah, um, I'm, I'm happy that they're doing it. If they're not doing it perfectly, yeah, it's, it's, it's not a good look. But at the end of the day, if people are benefiting, like, and I mean legitimate like metrics, we're seeing metrics from their advocacy or their solidarity, then I'll take a couple of mistakes. I'll take the messiness of what they're doing. If we can truly see that X company has done this, that they have tried to bring in people to the C-suite, if they've tried to invest in particular communities, if they uh, are supporting other businesses that are people, you know, so. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> and so when I say like, you know, investigate and analyze your yeah. practices. I don't mean investigate or analyze your heart. I mean, like, investigate and analyze, <laughs> no, know, yeah, 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 like how you, you are spending your yeah, money yeah, yeah. and who, yeah, who, who that money is going to. Because absolutely. even con in connection with Juneteenth, you know, part of the reason why uh, folks were enslaved in the first place and uh, why folks in Texas were uh, denied, denied their yeah. freedom. Mm -hmm for so long was economic. It was not like, like straight up. So I'm like, hey. the response to that needs to be economic as well. Every every <clears throat> empire was built on the backs of slavery. Yeah. And when we think about, I mean, and this is one reason why I loathe the idea of black people trying to disconnect themselves from America. And it's like, bruh, sis, I get it. You've been a part, or you've been, um, What's the word I'm looking for? You've been used, but that's even more reason for you to be like, this is my country because my ancestors built this thing. Mm -hmm. And we still to this day haven't justly got our due. Yeah. And so, no, you are American 
and you need to take ownership of this nation and claim your part of what your people and your history has built here. And to disconnect and say, you know what? We've contributed in building this empire. We leaving? Nah, son. I, like Denzel said, I'm leaving with something. Yeah, listen, <laughs> something is coming home he with me. Says, I, I'm listen, with something. What he took? He took the the flower arrangements. I believe <laughs> we getting some land. We, we get getting something. something. And so no, I just I think that um, at, to your point, like uh, the economic benefit of uh, of slavery. Nice, in some ways, needs to find itself through reparations in the celebration of Juneteenth. Yeah, one hundred percent. I think I was thinking about this the other day. Like, how do I want to celebrate Juneteenth? Like, how even do I want to? I want to talk about the history with my children. Like, that's that's a given. But what does it look like for 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 me and perhaps others to really to really take advantage of of Juneteenth? Because I mean, for so long our total liberation was like denied you know so it's like you know the <clears throat> emancipation proclamation happened in 1963 and then juneteenth in 1965 a hundred years later we have the civil rights act and the voting rights act of 1964 and 1965 and then you know in 2024 it's still kind of all kinds of craziness this idea that like we are it still feels like things are being delayed and denied. And because of that, I'm going to get what's mine. You know what I mean? I'm really going to, I'm really going to um, focus on like uh, wealth and not Can I ask you, what does that mean? Like, so practically, how have you tried to get what's yours? Yeah. I mean, I think first it's like on an emotional level, I think there's, there's something that I had to like overcome or like, Pursuing um, economic stability is not, it's fine. Like, it's something that I ought to do. Like, it's something that I can do. You know, pursuing uh, generational wealth and like focusing on generational wealth for my family is something that we ought to do. So, for example, um, like, even in the, I, so I was an educator for a while and uh, decided to leave education and got two really uh, good job offers, one from a smaller nonprofit and one from a, a very big brand in the nonprofit space. And the truth of the matter is, like, I chose the, the job that I'm at now because it was a bigger brand and a bigger check. And, like, I don't really feel no, no type of way no about that. Way, no. And won't. <laughs> <laughs> you know <what> I mean? <laughs> and, never will. and will not yeah. um and so i'm still doing like incredibly meaningful work and investing in my community but I, the huge decision maker was the brand name and the check and that's just the truth mm -hmm. and uh you know my husband and i starting uh our businesses and working on the side and doing all of these things we've opened 529 accounts for both of our children that we're investing in hundreds of dollars like monthly to set them up for success so it's not even just about like some things that we're denying ourselves today yeah. so that when they come of age they are in a much better position than we are so and i think that for me is how i take advantage of the freedoms that were won and that's how I, in my own little way, like um, resist the freedoms that are still being denied and try to accelerate that for like future generations. We are talking about Juneteenth liberation. What is a personal reflection yeah. that you have around this idea of liberation in connection to Juneteenth? Yeah, so I was thinking about this yesterday. Like, I think so much of our conversation is about um, what a philosopher, his last name is a big, uh, Berlin, Isaiah Berlin. He talks about um, positive freedom and negative freedom. Mm -hmm. And this idea that I think for many of us, our conversation is actually about negative freedom, which is like freedom from something like we're we have restraints we have limitations we're being censored we're being like systematically disenfranchised and so we're focusing on like breaking from those restraints and like there's there's that's important work um but then there comes a point to where it's like you're not just talking about negative freedom 
but you're moving into positive freedom. Mm -hmm. So not freedom from something, but freedom to do mm -hmm. something, freedom to set your own goals, freedom to self-actualize, freedom to have economic stability and economic freedom, which is not always the same thing as like, which is not yeah. the same thing as like gross capitalism, greed, and like unchecked wealth, right? But you do have the opportunity to like lean into that. Um, and I even think when we think about scripture, right, it's like we're free from sin and free to live, mm -hmm. right? Like mm -hmm. we're free from death and free to live. Right. And so I, I'm thinking about that, like almost shifting my focus from not neglecting the things that we need to be free from. But I think the way that I actually really get free from those things is try to remember that I'm free too. Absolutely. You know, you remove unhealthy habits in order. The best way mm -hmm. to remove unhealthy habits is replace them with something. Yes. That is healthy. And I want that yeah. to be my focus. Bob Dylan has a wonderful song that said, you gotta be, you're gonna be a slave to something. Mm -hmm. And uh, people hate the idea of being under the auspices of something. But the reality is, is we are always under the lordship of something and we often think it's ourselves but it's really to our desires and yeah. this is the beautiful thing of jesus is that he leads us to a liberation but a liberation what better thing to be is under the lordship or the liberation of the one who created all things yeah you know what i'm saying versus our finite view of liberation which has so many restrictions yeah so. <clears throat> <laughs> you guys have, you pass that over to me, Bobby. <clears throat> oh my God! So my my um reflection in Juneteenth is stemmed around this concept of liberty that I've been wrestling with for a while now. That liberty comes with four L's: it comes with land, it comes with leaders, it comes with law, and it comes with legacy. And this to me is what we see in Exodus. It's a holistic, I would also say complete view of liberty. God says, I want a people uh, for myself, mm -hmm. right? So he gives them land. He, he brings them out of an oppressive land to a particular land. Then he gives them leaders. So he sets Moses and Moses establishes elders. But then you can't just say, all right, live as you want to live to your point you have to have laws yeah like people need laws in order to govern you need to know how how am i to treat you how am i to 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 best create flourishing for us in this chaotic space in which we live but the ultimate thing that god says is so that they may worship me and this is where legacy comes in because you you don't want to be a people who has freedom who has land but you have nothing to pass down mm -hmm. the generations and so these are things that I think we try to replicate and we're trying to find even here in our present country. Um, we were a part of a, a land that enslaved us, then liberation liber like physically came. I am of the belief that I think um, we need to negotiate with the powers that be to give us Georgia and South Carolina and we can create our own yes, black state. But right you know, here. that's a whole nother conversation. <laughs> so there's land that we live in that yeah. we should have claim to. Yeah. And no matter how people feel about America, this is your country. So this is your land. Okay. You are American though. The rest of the world sees you as American. I've been to Africa. I've been to Indonesia. I've been to Europe. They do not see me as African. They see me as American. Okay. <laughs> Africans have told me. <laughs> and, I, and so I've embraced this idea that this is my land. And there are people who help lead me in this understanding. But there are certain laws and that govern us and how we should. Now, that doesn't mean all the laws are just, but there are laws that which govern us. And then ultimately, we are trying to establish ideas, principles, and values that we can pass down. That's the legacy. Yeah. But here's the thing that I think is beautiful about Jesus is even if I don't have any of those things, there's still a sense of wholeness and dignity that he gives us that you can flourish despite being in the land that is free, despite having leaders who love you, despite having laws that are just, and despite having something to pass down, because you can still worship and you can still know because you are made in his image. Mm -hmm. And I have seen this with slaves on plantations 
who didn't have land, who didn't have leaders law, they still understood what it meant to love the Lord. And we see this as Jesus is operating in an oppressive state where, yes, they have a land, but do they really have a land that is theirs? Do they really have leaders? No, because the leaders of their time are being folks who are manipulating them, using them. Um, the laws are obviously unjust in the sense that Jesus says, I'm coming to fulfill these things. And he's doing that so that we can create discipleship in a church and a legacy. And so I think this concept of understanding the Imago Dei in us gives us the truest sense of liberation. Though we do fight for land, though we do fight for leaders, laws, and legacy, the greatest sense of liberty is found in our relationship with Jesus. I'm already that. We're going to have a good time. Some of y'all may be uh, shaking your rump on Juneteenth. You might, well, you won't see me, but maybe. <laughs> you won't see it, hey, but perhaps. To each his own. <laughs>